Does that work? Yes. All right. So um, our next speaker, I don't know if I really need to introduce him, uh, Kasper Schleiser, uh, has been a software engineer for more than 15 years for working for various companies and lately uh, for INRIA and Freie Universität. And he's a day one contributor of Riot. I mean, actually one of co-founders of Riot. And he's going to talk about um, reimagining Riot in Rust. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. So yeah, reimagining Riot in Rust. I want to talk about uh, why we want to do this, how we want to, we're going to do this. Uh, tell you how far we got so far, talk a bit about the Rust ML community aspects, and then come to conclusions. Hello, check. Whoa. Hi. Right. So, uh, why do we want to do this? Right is pretty awesome. It has an awesome developer experience. It's easy to get started. There's lots of functionality, super well integrated, uh, runs on a lot of hardware, and even applications written against the right APIs are usually pretty portable. So all good? Well, um, the thing is we are actually hitting limits, limits of C programming. Be it API design, abstractions, safety, and with safety I mean memory safety, which C doesn't have. Thank you. <laughs> then there's the toolchain mess, which is a daily fight. Um, reliability issues, uh, that's technical stuff. There are other bottlenecks in, uh, in Riot C, um, I call it right, I mean right, as you know it. Um, that's the people power, maintenance, maintainers. We don't have, uh, there's like always lack of maintainers which can do work. So how do we solve this? There's Rust. Rust is this new language, challenging C, uh, similarly low level full control, but it comes with memory safety. It also has a lot more high level ergonomics um, and much more modern tooling. So uh, you have heard the stories, so I'm not going to go into more details here, but that's probably something that we want. So we have the awesome developer experience from Riot. We want the modern programming, want Rust memory safety. So, um, but can Rust be used uh, for embedded? Actually, yes, there's even like uh, some community uh, growing, which are pretty lively and there's tons of drivers, libraries, operating systems, frameworks, um, um, pretty cool stuff there. So um, can we just use that? Um, well, it turns out that a lot of that huge stuff is like it's pretty new, so there's a lot of like bare metal main loop style, style programming. Um, there are operating systems. Probably the oldest one around is TocOS. Uh, there's also Hubris, Hubris, which is pretty new. Um, they have like some decisions which limit their use a bit. For example, they are both uh, Cortex-M and MPU only at this time, and they don't do async Rust. So they didn't cut it, uh, cut it for us for, for many reasons. And they're like, they're like some frameworks. And frameworks, he means async frameworks, Rust asynchronous frameworks. There's, for example, Embassy Arctic. So we looked at those. Embassy, Embassy uh, advertises uh, itself as like the next generation framework for embedded applications, right, safe, correct, energy efficient, embedded code faster, using the Rust programming language, its async facilities, and the Embassy libraries. Sounds great, right? There's a long feature list, timers, real time, blah, blah, yada, yada, everything you want, bootloaders, and reasonable hardware support. So, sounds good, but, I mean, we are coming from Riot, we are used to a lot. Um, turns out that uh, MBC is actually more like a collection of building blocks. It's still this uh, um, application developer takes the main loop and starts um, stuffing up stuff in there. Uh, MBC has very high quality code, but it's also very low level, and um, uh, the re resulting applications are not very portable and it's lacking on uh, more complex examples. So it might be a good base, but yeah. Um, yeah, it is written in Rust. It has all the modern stuff we want, the Rust stuff, but it does not have the awesome developer experience, hi Mike, uh, that we want, right? That we're used to, that we can't go without. So we want it all. The thing is, can we teach memory safety to C, to Riot? No, can't, it's impossible. So the only way is to uh, bring the good stuff from Riot we have over to the Rust world. Yeah. So how do we think we can do this? A um, little bit of history with uh, Riot and Rust. Uh, I looked it up, Christian, in 2018, you did the first commit to the Riot wrappers. Uh, that is like a way um, to write Rust applications uh, on top of Riot, or write applications with Rust. Uh, that is now in master and can be used and is pretty useful. 
uh, but it's just the applications and not the system. So a couple of years later, 21 or something, we started exploring how to write a bit more of the, of the system itself in, in Rust. Like we started, for example, of course, with the core, with the scheduler and everything. And um, we then realized that it's possible, but because we have to keep, because it was supposed to be, we tried to be dropped in uh, into the C, C right? So, so it turned out to be very, uh, we, had to, we are bound by the API, by the C API. For example, the threading API, it's inherently unsafe, uh, C. Um, so matching that with Rust code makes the Rust code look like C code written in Rust, which is not good at all, and it waters down the memory safety and guarantees and everything. So we decided that's not a good way to go. Um, um, so we are more looking into full Rust, all Rust code, uh, or mostly Rust code. This is uh, the, the new thing we're doing since almost a year. We call it RiotRS, and um, yeah, we are using, we're trying to take Embassy and make it better, bring it closer to uh, Riot. What does that mean? I'm going to show some examples now, because I mean, remember Embassy is this low-level building block framework, and um, so there's a USB stack. Um, Embassy itself has like uh, 15 versions of an example of the use for the USB C with 15 versions for 15 different MCUs. Um, they all have pretty MCU specific clock and peripheral setup code. And then copy and pasted USB stack setup, copy and pasted USB class setup, like for zero Ethernet, copy and pasted network stack setup, and then copy and pasted logic. But it's not just plain copies, they are slightly different. So finding, finding your way through that to get started with maybe just using the USB Ethernet device as a network stack is uh, it's already like a day or two work just to get like something going. And um, well, so what we do in Writer S, we take all these examples, um, we cleanly separate out the MCU specific part and then provide like shared USB stack setup. We, we, we condense this down to one USB serial example. There's no USB Ethernet example, I explain why. Well, so. Basically, we make this like, like the whole USB stack like a set of modules that can be easily used with a lot less boilerplate for increased reusability and portability. And where did the USB Ethernet example go? We don't use it anymore because USB Ethernet is just like one configuration options for the basic TCP networking example, or any networking example. It's just, just enable use. Okay, USB Ethernet, bam, it's there if your board supports it. No boilerplate needed. Another example would be the um, peripheral APIs. Um, in the Rust ecosystem, there's this nice, uh, it's an API, it's a trait in Rust speak, it's called embedded hell, or now also embedded hell async, uh, which is the Rust way to uh, access peripherals like GPIY, SQLC and stuff. And um, having that, that's, it's supposed to be a minimal API, that the, the, so minimal that no one comes, uh, gets the idea that maybe he should write a second one, you know, because this one doesn't cut it, so it's really like very generic. Um, and there's tons of drivers, uh, hundreds of drivers. There's a list, a digitalized list, a searchable list of them, like hundreds of drivers that can be used between all the Rust uh, emitted ecosystem projects. So that is the, the side towards the drivers. The implementations, um, there are many of them, right? And um, the initialization of these, uh, the objects that fall out there that can be used by the drivers, uh, they, they're, they are not, uh, they're not part of the API. That means if you write an application, there's a usually MCU-specific or framework OS-specific setup of your I2C stuff, and then you hook up the driver, that, that then just works. But this, uh, this, this first stuff, um, well, not portable. So what, what did we do for WriterS? We, we analyzed like for the, the embassy traits, like embassy has implementations for NF, Raspberry Pi, STM, and some others. So we're looking at the, the initialization API for that and um, condense it down and abstract it and unify it and then have one API that actually works. We just have to change the pin defines. And yeah, that enables to make, to create portable peripheral using applications. So more examples, high level features like a random number generator. Embassy had uh, some examples on how to actually use the random hardware on some boards or something. Um, and there's obviously like libraries for so the random number generators, there's also random shade there, but actually everybody who writes an application needing random is expected to figure out how to do this with a random number generator peripheral, choose maybe a pseudo random number generator, do it again and again, right? Um, so in WriterS we just did that. Uh, for the supported boards you can just enable the random module and the APIs are there, like fast random number generator and one cryptographically secure. 
so time saved. There's more, there's for example the co-op stack. Embassy just didn't come with anything of, of like on application layer, it just stops at the, at the uh, below that. So in writer S, we wrote the complete, or Christian did, ha, the complete uh, co-op at score stack based on embedded null. And um, this can now just be enabled or almost now and just be enabled uh, in writer S. And it goes on like this, the build system. In embassy, um, most examples, or actually most Rust embedded uh, uh, application projects come with like a cargo-based build system and there's at some point hard-coded board-specific stuff. Because cargo doesn't do the concept of boards, it knows architectures like uh, ARMv7 or RISC-V, but it doesn't know NF52DK. So for that, more settings are needed, like which flasher to use, which uh, everything is. So um, in Riot S, uh, we wrap cargo in a different build system called Lace, and um, in there we encode all that information, the board and MCU specific, which target and flash and stuff. And we generate the cargo configuration on the fly. And that gives us one of my favorites, uh, the option to compile any example of Riot uh, for any board. We now have the same with Riot S, so just name the board and compile if the MCU or board has the prerequisites. Yeah, so you see the pattern. Um, we take what embassy has in building blocks, uh, we increase portability, we use boilerplate, we provide high-level turnkey features and uh, whatever else in OS, what calls itself OS. Yeah, so how far did we get with that? Well, this is uh, last year's features uh, sheet. We had basically nothing. You see that it was an async runtime. We could just import it but didn't use because because it didn't do anything. We added the preemptive scheduler because we had the code lying around and we could print Hello World on a debug console at some point. So nothing but an idea. And now one year in, um, actually uh, there's like features. Um, there's uh, more, there's a network stack which is quite capable. Uh, with, uh, right now it works on Ethernet or Wi-Fi, it's dual stack, there's co-op, there's TCP, there's an HTTP server. Um, so already pretty useful. There's uh, peripherals that can be used. We have extended our, our board and MCU support to, um, like I think it's 15 boards right now, but it's more like a one of each architecture that we find interesting. And the architecture or platform means like, for example, the Nordic NRFs, Raspberry Pi, the STM32, a couple of those, and the uh, RISC-V uh, ESP32. And on all of those, uh, we have like examples, a Blinky, a TCP example, an UDP example, a USB serial example, some examples. Not so many, not as many as Riot has, but some and growing. And the kicker is that all of those are now portable. There's like one example that can be compiled for all of these boards. And yes, at some point in the Blinky, there's an if dev choosing the exact pin to use, but that's all. It's not, not like the boilerplate that um, MSC had before. Um, yeah. So um, what, what's missing? Obviously, we're not done. We have like glaring holes in our feature sheet. Like, for example, we don't do IPv6 auto configuration which sucks for testing if there's no slack. Um, we don't do any 8, uh, 8 to 2, 15, 4, 6 low pan yet. Some of that just needs to be wired up, but I think upstream doesn't, uh, there's support missing, yeah. Uh, we don't do any power management yet. We don't have software updates, so not production ready, you could say, feature-wise, but we're getting there. All right, um, now let's check out like how we're doing on, for example, boilerplate, because that is one of my favorites. To the left, you see the minimal Riot C project. It's basically Hello World with a couple of new lines removed. Uh, that's 10 lines uh, to get Hello World out of all the two, three, 400 by now boards of Riot that are supported, uh, which I still think uh, is pretty amazing. So that's the gold standard. Riot S, we are almost there. Our minimal project now has like 16 lines of significant code. And um, um, I know four lines that are gonna go in the near future. So I think we're getting there. But I did not put the, the, the standard Rust embedded boilerplate here because it wouldn't fit on the, it's uh, way more. Yeah, reliability. I mean, this is a reliability session, right? Um, we can't really say anything about this because we, it's too, we're too new and didn't have enough exposure to have a proper testing or reports or anything. I can just say it feels extremely robust compared to what I was used to and I see like different kind of development. I have one anecdote. Um, we had this HTTP server example ready that would work on USB Ethernet. And then I just uh, wired up the, the Wi-Fi driver for the Raspberry Pi Pico 
And the first time I compiled it together, it worked. And um, I could like access the, uh, the, the demo page, the lower MIPSUM uh, over the network. And um, I kept it running and it kept running and it kept running over days and weeks and months. And we added it to our monitoring. And um, at some point I forgot about it until the home office moved. So it was there somewhere sitting and it was just working. And um, to me, I was like, getting with every day that passed in the beginning, I was getting more impressed because my impression with uh, Riot, I, not my, my experience with Riot is that, uh, I don't know, it would stop, I don't know. It was a different experience. It just kept, and it was the first time I compiled this. There was no debugging or anything. All right, um, so how about the uh, overhead for Thrust? Uh, it's always hard to say because obviously you measure what you want to show. Uh, but still, I try to get something that has uh, mostly similar uh, feature set, which is the min most minimal stuff there is, Blinky. Blinky uh, blinks uh, a GPIO uh, pin every 500 milliseconds, so that needs some timer infrastructure, some GPIO, and blinks, yeah. The other example is minimal networking. For the right folks, that means GNSC minimal. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I made a similar example for right OS, and um, I was actually pretty impressed myself because the, the code size is like comparable. And um, yeah, comparable, not an issue. Hmm. So, so for me, that means uh, we can actually have it all. We can have the awesome yeah, developer experience with all the portability and uh, convenience we want and we can have the memory safety at the same time. But there's work to do. Anyhow, next thing, I want to talk about the community um, or the ecosystem. So this, you see here, is like a quickly meshed together, completely incomplete uh, graph with stuff of uh, the Rust ecosystem. Um, where right is just a little part, and um, it's a directed graph. It should be a uh, not directed graph because the idea here is that these are all projects or parts of projects or, or packages or some um, that are used by all the others. It's like, it's like a graph, basically, but it's uh, distributed. It's like not one entity or many entities. You can see MSC there and Arctic, bare metal, um, at some point using the same stuff. Compare that, for example, to this. OK. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Nimble is the only example. I already had this like exported to PNG before. It's Nimble is the only thing that I'm aware of where actually uh, maybe embed TLS, but those are like the things that might be reused between those. But other than that, hmm? there's some, okay. But also the embed, it's, uh, the C embedded ecosystem is like 50 years old, right? It, it, it's, it's still like, uh, like if it comes to application portability, there's silos, right? It's a silo, Sephira is a silo. You can't port from Sephira to write. It's not, not doable. So the idea is Rust embedded ecosystem is like growing, alive, gaining traction, getting vendor support, it's distributed, there's lots of code sharing going on. And also what is very interesting to me is that actually Rust as a language is co-evolving. Because, um, let me just go get back, like these, uh, the lower ones there, the Rust embedded, this is not all of them, but they are basically maintained by the Rust embedded working group, which is part of the Rust foundation umbrella, which is... Uh, developing the language. So there is like the Rust Foundation itself is part of also of this Rust embedded stuff, which means there's like a connection and talking going on, which is, uh, I think, very positive. All right. So what it, for example, means is uh, we, had, um, we had this uh, co-op stack, uh, which was based on embedded NAL, which is supposed to be one of these APIs that is working everywhere. But um, small TCP, the network stack that um, right, as using through Embassy, uh, was missing some implementations. So um, Christian made a pull request to small TCP, which is, I don't know if it's merged by now. Um, it will be merged soon, and as soon as it is merged, not only we of right as can use it, but Embassy, Arctic, Bare Metal, everyone in this completely different projects with different focus, uh, all uh, can profit from that, benefit from that. And actually, there's a lot more going on in the other direction. Like, there's RiderS, we are just using Embassy, and uh, there's features popping up everywhere. Like, I don't know, there's a USB audio stack in the queue. There's a RespPy Pcode 2 code that just landed the last weeks, like, basically on, this, on the lunch day or something. Not sure we want to use the first iteration of the silicon, but, but the, the code is there. And I think, um, yeah. So integrating new stuff is, means it's very easy to do. I will probably hack up the first support on the hackathon day um, yeah. 
Okay, that already brings us to the Outlook. Um, what are features that we have around the corner? Dual core support, we just set a new iteration of the of a pull request that adds dual core support to REST by Pico and extends us soon. We're gonna we finish the peripheral API unification. We have a pull request for KV config storage based on sequential storage. Uh, we better integrate our two build systems so that one becomes more invisible. And we're finally at like hill testing. So that's like all happening next weeks. Until next year, we obviously want to fix the, the network stack feature holes. We want to get back low power networking and obviously proper IPv6 support. And um, secure software updates, power management. Those are the big things we want to tackle there. Um, there's two more things that are on the horizon. Uh, one is like formal verification. Uh, with the right as we always had, we're like pretty close to these ideas of using Rust uh, as a specification language and make two proofs around that. Hex is such a tool. Um, Hex has this tool, uh, this, this workflow where you have regular Rust converted to F star and then do proofs about it. And we have that already integrated in OCI. Uh, bare minimum, we are using it for the run queue of the scheduler um, and we don't do any proofs yet. I think it's proving panic freedom, right? It's type checking, yeah, so panic freedom is proof for our run queue. Um, but we're also the guinea pig for, for using hex for embedded by, by Crispin and um, we want to extend this a lot. And yeah, we're also gonna integrate the ferrocene compiler, which is a, a qualified compiler for Rust. Basically it's the Rust compiler, but qualified. It's not a different compiler, it's the same, just has did the paperwork. Not sure if the paperwork alone will increase reliability. There's potential. Yeah, that brings me to the conclusions. Mm, we think we can match the awesome sides of Riot, meaning uh, writing portable applications with the batteries included, feeling and generally awesome developer experience. We think with Riot S we can actually improve on embedded Rust, like elevate the layer of abstraction and turnkey solutions, and so we can bring the memory safety there. We think that this development model of being distributed can fix a few of Riot's bottle, Riot's bottlenecks by sharing, for example, hardware support, driver development and maintenance, concentrate on the core stuff, and obviously modern tooling, which is a huge productivity increase subjectively. Subjective, yeah? Yeah, and there's also always the memory safety. That's why we are doing all this mostly, because we think um, uh, it adds to the security guarantees. And formal verification, is it there? Yeah. All right, that's it. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Jasper. Questions? I see someone here. Again, if there are questions on the chat, I can relay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I can see indeed Rust has a lot of uh, advantages, for example, reliable and uh, memory safe. And I would say that indeed will benefit uh, embedded systems. Uh, but I want to ask, have we thought about uh, the market share of uh, this programming language, Rust, comparing with uh, C or C++? Like, uh, because, for example, I mentioned this because Yeah, I think we get we are heading. Um, it's it's hard to hire Rust talent, uh, not as like not compared to C talent. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, the, I think it's it's growing. Rust is it's, it's, it's just growing. It's not where it's where C it, and it will not be. C is just too old. But there's like little companies like Twitter Golf, for example, here um, that you can hire everywhere. That are always like happy to get work. So. Um, hard to say for me. Obviously harder to hire Rust people. So, so actually my point is that it's possible to make uh, Rust like both usable and still like available in the Riot. So we have actually users from both C programmers and Rust programmers. Yeah. So um, if you want to use Rust with Riot um, to write applications, that is obviously possible. Uh -huh. Having hybrid code bases is difficult. Linux has just a lot of drama lately proving that, basically, because there's always like the one 
20, 30 years experienced C programmers who say, well, we don't want to learn Rust. But, uh, um, okay. yeah. well, can't convince those, I guess. Every project needs to decide. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, any other uh, questions or comments here, there? Uh, I think Hannes was first and then we'll move down the line. Um, you had one slide up that showed the community, and I think this, the first one with Riot was uh, compared to this, this one, uh, was a little bit biased, I would say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, I think it's an, it hits an important point because it seems that there has been some really interesting development in the community where previously everyone worked on its own, not by coincidence, they actually wanted to work on their own. They wanted to be different than the others. Uh, and now, going to the, back to the other slide, it seems that we are moving into a world where the uh, embedded operating systems, the ATOS, is essentially a profile of a common underlying stack. It, it almost looks like, because you said you take an embassy, you pick out a couple of pieces, that's what you do. Like, would, like thinking long-term, is Riot OS one profile and Cephal is a different profile, just selecting different building blocks? Yeah, I think the key differentiate, like the key thing here is that uh, Rust has like these way advanced um, abstraction possibilities that C just don't have. And if you look at this, this is like C or C++ uh, where it's hard to, to do proper abstractions, zero cost abstractions, without having too much actual code and how to do it in there. And uh, in Rust, that is like uh, just much, much, much easier, which makes, makes it much more, much easier to just t uh, share code. Yeah, that's it. So I think something like this uh, would be difficult in C. Well, the, for example, uh, one easy low hanging fruit would have been. Also, for example, one to reuse a bootloader. Some of the operating systems you showed on the other slide, they actually share a bootloader. Uh, MCU boot, for example, mm -hmm. Minute. Actually, MCU boot came out of Minute. Uh, and, and Cepha, for example, can use uh, MCU boot. So you can actually, you can do that if you want. But it looks like previously people didn't want it, but now, for some reason, uh, which I don't fully understand yet, uh, that, that did happen. Well, I think there's an evolution going on. For example, in, in Rust, the, the peripheral crates, peripheral access crates, are generated from SVD files. So, so in Rust, uh, the vendor provides these SVD files with a structured YAML, and then we, there's a Rust code generated from that that encodes some of the constraints, and then usually the actual hardware abstractions are written on top of that generated Rust code. Um, that is, already makes total sense to share because it's just one structure to Rust uh, it's like basically perfect data sheet, right? It's the data sheet and language you want to write against. And in C, it's different, right? In C, you get a buggy data sheet, and then you start looking at the registers, and then you start using the headers, the, the headers which are also generated probably from the SVD, but it's just not the same. So, it's, um, I don't know. So, Rust showed that it is possible to use SVD files, and that makes sense to share because uh, it's just like just a minimal base. and. Uh, in C, we didn't have that 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the, all the OSs you see here, the projects, they started back then. And uh, in Riot, we made a point of rewriting uh, or writing all the hardware support on our own in the beginning, at least. Now we imported more, I think. But uh, back then, we took those uh, header files and uh, wrote from scratch the peripheral support. And uh, yeah, well, different than Rust. So I think it's really like not the memory safety of Rust. It's like the, the bits of cargo, which allows to easily share code and reuse with similar guarantees. It's like the mindset, because the, the community started from, from scratch, not like C. It's like this one build system that unifies all of that. Um, and the language features about abstraction, importing, zero cost abstraction, traits. So I think really that is the difference. In C, it's just much more, you need much more communication. And actually, like there's huge C projects like Linux, for example, that has internally trouble keeping the APIs up to date. And uh, so they're like slowly transitioning to Rust, but uh, I think Rust, it would be a different story. Okay, my question now. Um, yeah, so I think like Rust is uh, getting more, more and more popular, um, like a lot of people start using it and 
um, yeah, it's making it more diverse as well in uh, this operating system. Um, I wanted to know if it's also because one big advantage is the like low energy consumption of uh, Riot. Um, is there any measurement if there's like any, if it's still lightweight when using Rust instead of C? Um, as a grassroots, <laughs> as a, uh, since it's really a true grassroots project, right? Yeah. Well, so uh, with Writer-S, actually, we didn't do any power measurements whatsoever. Um, I know that um, that uh, of, because Embassy is this asynchronous executor, there is spots where to stop the system, and I know that there's Embassy projects which go actually really very down with their power consumption. Um, we haven't tackled abstracting all of that. It is possible with Rust to be as power, low power as with uh, C. That's like the language doesn't make the difference there, I think. Um, Rust is not the only modern memory safe programming language invented in the last decade with the intent to replace C. Um, especially Go is quite popular in the desktop and in the server world, but com to, to the best of my knowledge, completely unused in the embedded world. Do you know why this is the case? Well, my point would be um, Go pretty heavily depends on uh, memory allocation. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a garbage collector in Go that makes it difficult. And you can run it without garbage collector, but that makes your language more difficult to use. Do you want to say something, uh, Benjamin? No? Yeah. So here's one more question. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, so you motivated uh, using Rust by the, um, the, its property to be memory safe and that this is checked at compile time. Um, so how much, if you would need to give an educated guess, how much of your Rust code is actually safe Rust code and how much is unsafe Rust code? Um, I would say 99% is safe or more. And unsafe doesn't mean it's unsafe, it just means it's marked as unsafe, yeah. I would, I don't, you know, I think it's a huge ecosystem, there's tools to, to check that. I mean, we are doing, we are pretty high level, right? So we get away with basically losing no unsafe. Uh, but that's the point, but, right? Yeah. Would be good to measure. So um, uh, one question, why is it called why it was? I mean, it's a complete different code base, as you said. It uh, has a complete different license model. And this also has a completely different community model. So why it is called why Rust? I mean, Rust I understand, but I don't understand the prefix. Um, I would say because when we started, we actually tried to replace um, parts of Riot, improve Riot with Rust code in the middle, and that's when the name got coined, also because um, the developers of Riot RS um, are all also Riot maintainers, or they used to yeah, be. But... And also because we, we were not really clear on our branding yet, so there's a TBD what happens there. It's but in, in the end, it's like, um, I mean, right, it's like code, it's community, it's also spirit and... Uh, exactly, and this is completely different. I mean, you have a completely different license, you have a different com uh, code base, you have a different community model, so there is actually no relation that I see. Uh, maybe we can that, uh, discuss that tomorrow in the General Assembly, because it's a question we have also to the right community. And one thing regarding the uh, formal verification. I mean, um, two things. First, it, formal verification is maybe a little bit overrated, considering, for example, the TLS disaster. And why can you not formally verify Riot? Um, we certainly can, and C code has been verified. It's just way more effort. Um, yeah, and um, this new thing with um, hacks, or the, what it brings to the table is that regular code without annotations can then be formally verified. This also splits the verification and the code writing, right? I can write Rust code, I can't do proofs, but um, with hacks, I can do Rust code and someone else can do the proofs. So that's why, well, I don't know, we hope, we hope that improves something. We don't know yet. Any other questions? Then, oh, yeah, one last, and then we have to move on.
With Riot IS, we got um, Rust with no uh, libstd, I think, was the marker that's set there. Um, with C++, we can do many of the, uh, we could have done many of the things like uh, more abstract uh, writing of uh, compile time code, more uh, safe memory management, um, but we wouldn't have used the STL. How is the Rust with no STD more standard than C++ without STL? Okay, so I'm totally not a C++ expert, um, but my experience with C++ is that it's actually, it's like a huge and complex language that has been developed like over 30 years and has grown in different directions and it's actually pretty hard to restrict yourself to a certain subset, especially with a larger community. So, I don't know. I think the last, the last larger embedded address system that used C++ wasn't that, isn't that like, didn't that just close shop up? I, I don't know. Honestly, I know, I know C++. Okay. Okay. One, two, three, and there was a lot of questions. Um, I propose we stop here, and uh, for next questions, either for the community side or from technical side, maybe there'll be a, a, a breakout session tomorrow, I don't know, and general assembly, so to discuss all these things. It's uh, indeed an interesting... Uh, Interesting question to discuss. Now we're going to move to our next session. Um, yeah. Let's thank our speaker.